Come, come sit further up. Come sit closer. This is an intimate conversation. Yeah, come on, come on. Yeah. You can do it for an hour. It's just for an hour. Wait. I'll let y'all take your seats again later. We can't barely see you. Don't be scared. See our Norwegian colleagues in the back? Can I invite y'all to come join us a little bit closer? <laughs> oh, we're Keep nervous. Your distance. Okay. <laughs> come on, y'all. All right. We're obviously anyway. a really big draw here. Yeah. Well, that's all right. <laughs> Don't change the rules. Here. Regardless, so. regardless, uh, I'm very excited to be presenting this uh, very, a special lunchtime panel. Uh, I've invited Mr. Torsten Kroening and Ms. Jean Maserve to come and talk to us a little bit about the media and how space security issues are presented in the media, in particular the types of language that we use when we see stories about you know, demonstrations, ASAT tests, Space Force, uh, all these different terms that get thrown around quite, quite often. Sometimes they're there to you know, sell headlines, of course, and to, to sell copies. But at the same time, how does it impact the way that we discuss these issues here in the CD, in, in the General Assembly, and just in multilateral dialogues in general? How does that language impact the way that we perceive each other's space programs? And so with that, I'm very happy to present this fascinating panel. Torsten, please. Thank you, Dan. Um, and thank you very much for having us here. So ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, uh, it's my pleasure, it's my honor uh, to host this dialogue here after the, um, the lunch today. I mean, as you see, we are sitting here on the same panel, so it's not a typical media set up here um, for an interview, but we, tr we try our best to achieve it. With me on stage is Jean Mercerf, a recognized journalist. You have seen her yesterday. I will give um, Jean the word in a few seconds uh, to talk about her exciting career. So why we are here at the Space Security Conference to talk about journalism. Daniel wanted us um, me ask, uh, and ask us to give the panel a specific purpose to provide some awareness and insights into the way that geopolitical challenges and issues, especially those related to space, are currently presented in the news. He wants to know how journalists choose certain language, as he mentioned, um, why they cover certain topics, and most of all, how that shapes the public perception of certain issues. And honestly, after digesting that, ch that challenge and some interesting calls back and forth, um, we think we will get you informed, hopefully inspired about our work and the challenges actually you have um, with the topics uh, discussed here. We also like uh, discussing the role of media for the entire space industry. After the first round of introduction, we will cover, um, we will try to cover uh, four areas where we will dive in uh, a bit, meaning um, I created about 200 questions, so um, what keeps us afloat. Um, first, um, space perceived by the public, then second, space race 2.0, space security and the public, and space as inspiration for the next generation. We would like to spark some thoughts on how we can better communicate about the topics we love space. At the end, we will like to get into a dialogue with you and ask for your feedback and your questions, or your burning questions. And one topic I want to raise here at the beginning, I mean, I, I checked the uh, Facebook live stream at the um, session prior to us. Make a guess how many thousand people watched it. Eight. So. There were, I think half of them were in this room. Um, <laughs> just to set the baseline where we are with this topic and the public. Yeah. So with that, um, let's start. Jean, would you like to introduce yourself? And I mean, that, that's a sure. weird thing this here. Is so, a lot. So. Um, and give the audience some background of you. Yeah, I'd rather talk about the issues rather than me, but just to, to set the stage a little bit. Um, I have had a long career in television news. Uh, I ended up at ABC News eventually, where I was a correspondent for seven years, and then I went to CNN, where I was an anchor. And then on 9-11, uh, CNN turned to me and said, we don't know what Homeland Security is, but you're covering it. 
Um, and so I created the Homeland Security beat for them, which included intelligence, and it included cyber, and included aviation security. And every so often, my beat did touch up against space, even though I never specifically covered space. Just a couple of instances. Um, the thrill of space got to me on one of the anniversaries of the moon landing when I was sent down to the Air and Space Museum on the Mall in Washington and told to create a story. And someone came up to me and said, hey, you want to talk to my father-in-law? He helped build the lunar module. And he told, I went over to interview this guy, and he told me that all the guys who built it autographed it. And then, of course, it's left up on the moon. So I'm talking to this guy whose name is up on the moon. I thought it was a pretty cool little story. Um, another, another instance where I bumped up against space. This is the story that never came to be. Um, my brother-in-law uh, was a minister down in the Tidewater area of Virginia. And he came to me one day and told me about a woman in his congregation who had worked for NASA and had done all sorts of mathematical calculations for the early space missions. So I called this woman up. We had a very long conversation. She was about 90 years old, African-American, clearly sharp as a whip, was still tutoring young African-American kids in math and science to try to encourage them to go into this line of work. She'd had this long career with NASA. I'm no dummy. I go, great story. So I call up NASA and I said, what can you tell me about this woman, Katherine Johnson? And they said to me, we never heard of her. I then was diverted by other stories and other news. I should have more amb been more ambitious about, about following it up. But just a few years later, the book and the movie Hidden Figures come out. And who's the central character? Katherine Johnson. So that was my big fish that got away on the space beat. Um, but I, uh, since leaving CNN, I've worked as a communications coach, so I have a lot of ideas about how you guys could be more compelling when you're talking about your subject. Um, and in addition, um, I've just had the luck of, um, of being able to moderate uh, a number of, at a number of conferences on space. It started out at the Halifax International Security Forum. Uh, one of my panelists is right here. Um, and then people at the Munich Security Conference saw that, so they invited me to come to Munich last year and do a couple of space-related events. There I met Renata Dwan. She and Daniel invited me here to do this. So I've sort of fallen into space, but I am not a space nerd. I am a communicator, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Over to you. Tell us about yourself. Thank you. It's, it's great not to have another space nerd here. On. <laughs> We've got a whole room. <laughs> yeah, and I, I would consider myself also a space nerd. So um, just a bit about me, um, what entitled me to, to do these interviews and doing all the other stuff. Uh, I I'm, I'm grew up uh, more or less with slightly after, no, sli slightly before Apollo um, uh, behind the Iron Curtain in, in uh, East Berlin. So. Um, Saying that Apollo never happened to me. I mean, even uh, I was around. Uh, Apollo 11, uh, Apollo 17, 27, 27 was not an issue in the East German media. So Vietnam was. So again, Apollo never happened. What I think is, is, is bad. So I s studied computer science when the war felt. And then afterwards in my career, I looked uh, after international business at the forefront of technologies like um, t TV, so digitizing uh, TV uh, in, in Europe with Lucent Digital Video, SAS Astra, where I uh, was involved in the first uh, um, SATCOMs. Um, then I have done a bit of business uh, in the Middle East uh, because I was super excited about the power of vision and resources. Um, and one project I heavily was, heavily was involved during the Arab Spring was uh, the training of the Omani government and military on satellite uh, communication and space or stuff, uh, and they're still working towards the first satellite. So uh, with that, got invited by the ISU to do my MBA there about, um, and I wrote my thesis about uh, capacity building in emerging space countries on the example of the Gulf states. Again, that was eight years, seven years ago, before all this hype happens. So I had the pleasure to talk or interview people which are now in really uh, remarkable positions are in, in the Middle Eastern countries. So um, intrigued by the Middle East stuff, 
Um, four years later, or four years ago, um, together with Dr. John Sheldon, who I think a few of you know here in this area, we started our Space Watch Middle East, our what is now spacewatch.global. Um, our aim was to cover the space activities of emerging space actors in the geopolitical context. Uh, and today we're covering Middle East, Africa, Asia Pacific, uh, Russia, CIS, and Europe with a non-US view on it. That's why our, our company our, is based here in Switzerland uh, in, in Bern. Even I live in Berlin, John in Abu Dhabi, and we are spread around the world. John is the mastermind behind uh, all of that, uh, and I'm the German engine, um, what it needs to run such a show. Um, and three years after now, after we launched it, we have about 15,000 visitors on, on the website and serving over 600 professionals with our by weekly uh, newsletter as part of our business intelligence offering. And just to mention uh, to, to, uh, to you here, I do have a day job uh, as well um, as part of a private lunar um, exploration company called PT Scientist, where I work as a chief business officer. So I, I do a bit actually in space, for space, on the forefront of regulation and all the things that are possible when we go private to the moon. So. I'm aware of most of the things. With this long introduction, let us dive, dive into this topic, starting with the space perceived by the public, where we, reporting on these topics, get hurt. So, reporting on space, Gene, our space seems to get a lot of media coverage. Let's start with easy ones. Why? So I do come from the American perspective, and I'll be talking about the US media. I cannot speak to what it looks like in other parts of the world. Um, but it's actually kind of surprising to me in this media environment, which in the United States is largely dominated by domestic politics, that space actually still has a place. And I would say, I, I'm old fashioned, I actually get newspapers and I clip them for various projects I'm working on. And every week there are four or five clippings that I come across just in the New York Times or the Washington Post that relate to some aspect of space. Um, sometimes it's science, uh, sometimes it has to do with industry and the latest launch, sometimes it has to do with what governments are doing. I would say short shrift is probably given to the topics that you folks have been discussing here. These are not topics that I see discussed a lot um, in the media, nor in private conversations amongst people. Um, I mentioned I never was a space journalist. I talked to my former colleague, um, Miles O'Brien. Some of you may know Miles or know his name. He was uh, with CNN for years covering the space program. He still covers uh, space for the news hour. Um, I, he likes to call me his first TV wife because we used to co-anchor together back in the day. Um, when I spoke to him the other day, he said, reporting on space is a mile wide and it's an inch deep. It used to be that all of the major publications and the major networks had people who were dedicated specifically to covering this topic. They knew it, they understood it, they were well connected. Now they don't have those people on staff anymore for the most part. Uh, and so it's falling to people with more general knowledge to report on topics that sometimes require more depth. But, so it's a little alarming. But I think that has two sides. So, um, I mean, we have heard here over the last uh, two days these really highly complex, partially unsolved topics. So how do we connect on these complex issues with the public? And do, are we doing it at all? Well, I would hold out as an example of someone who I think is doing a pretty good job. It's NASA. Um, and actually, a former CNN producer was working for them when they were putting um, uh, the Phoenix down on Mars. And her son turned to her and said, have you ever heard of Twitter? Uh, she hadn't. But she checked it out. She recognized a good thing when she saw it. And she started the first person Twitter account for the Phoenix. And this is just when Twitter was really getting going. And if there were any people who were into this kind of technology, it was the people in the space community. And it became one of the most followed Twitter accounts. And I was just looking at some numbers before, uh, before we started. Uh, and it's something like 60 million 
followers between Twitter and Instagram for NASA. They have a number of different specialized accounts. So I think they are harnessing social media, which reaches so many people, and having a pretty, pretty fair amount of success, not with the complexity, not with the depth, but at least generating interest in these but, topics. But 16 million, it's, just it's as a, a lot less than Kim Kardashian. Oh, yeah, I'm, and, and half, just but. putting it into the U.S. context, out of 300 million, 350 million people you have there. So well, that's true. That's uh, true. I mean, it sounds big, but... So, I hate to generalize, but I don't think Americans basically are into science, generally speaking. Um, uh, maybe I'm being too pessimistic here. Um, but I, uh, and now we actually have a, an administration that some people perceive as being anti-science. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I just think people are caught up in other aspects of their life and aren't paying enough attention to this. There are the occasional things like the black hole, right? Mm -hmm. The photograph of the black hole. It was the top of the fold in every newspaper. It was sort of one of those oh wow moments. And might I say, and this is relevant to this group, very much an international effort, right? They harness telescopes all over the world in order to capture that image. And the scientific community um, is really interested in this international synergy and cooperation because obviously you all benefit from one another's um, knowledge and data. Um, they want this kind of collaboration and my understanding from talking to someone at the National Science Foundation is that there was a lot of thought given to how to present this as an international project mm -hmm. and also how to use language in a way that people were going to understand what this was about. And there was pushback from scientists, which is another thing we can talk about. Coming back to language, you just mentioned it, and um, that was also one of the topics um, um, Daniel wanted to address um, here. Um, so language, for example, it's Star Wars, Space Force, um, and then a number of new words we learned here over the last days. So war fighting domain, doctrine, dominance, predominance, however. Um, and we thought we have had bad words uh, for, for what we do. So how does this language is perceived? Language is important no matter what issue you're talking about. That's why uh, politicians and corporations hire all kinds of consultants to help them test and massage all kinds of words and word combinations in order to present their position um, in the best possible light. Um, and what happens with journalism is that sometimes governments or industry comes up with these great phrases that uh, through, largely through the work of consultants, that do resonate, that are exciting, that do capture something. And there's too often a tendency, I think, on the part of media to echo those words, mm -hmm. even when they may not be completely accurate. Uh, and I think that the media does have some soul searching to do. You see it, for instance, in the military domain. Let's just talk about that for a minute. Um, in the second Gulf War, there was talk about softening up the defenses. What does that really mean? Dropping a lot of bombs and probably killing a fair number of people, some of them non-combatants but the military language didn't want to reflect that clearly, so softening up the defenses became the term of art, and the media regurgitated it because it was short and it was simple and not complex, and we have a limited amount of time or a limited amount of column space, and so there's a tendency sometimes to ad adopt the language. There are other instances where the media comes up with, with these short, catchy phrases. Uh, because they they are easy, they're yeah. easy, but but so we're watching it in the U.S. right now play out not so much in the space domain, but I would argue in the immigration debate. This may be happening in Europe as well. You'll have to tell me. But you know, what do you call these people who are coming across the border? Are they Ill excuse me illegal aliens or are they refugees? Well, those two words carry a very different sort of emotional weight, right? Mm -hmm. um, and a different political connotation. So reporters have to be aware of that, and they have to be aware, I think, 
uh, and, and most are. Um, all of the news organizations have elaborate style books which spell out exactly how you're supposed to deal with certain subjects linguistically. Um, these are updated on a regular basis in an effort to make sure that we are not straying um, from what should be, in my professional opinion, neutral ground. Mm -hmm. um, but the media landscape in the U.S. is very different now than it used to be. Um, I don't know, again, if this is happening in other parts of the world to the extreme it is in the U.S., but if you watched Fox News and you watched MSNBC, you would not know that they were covering the same government. You just wouldn't know. <laughs> because they're doing different stories, they're talking about it different ways, they're using different voices, um, and where that wasn't the, the case in the past uh, as much. Um, there was a real effort to be nonpartisan. There was a strict line between reporting and between opinion. That wall has now been totally breached. Now the two have bled into one another. I think it's a great disservice to the American public because nobody knows who to believe. Yeah. I think that's one of the topics we come um, back later. Um, I mean, you might have heard that we had um, elections here in Europe. Oh, yes, last, I did hear that. Last weekend. Yes. Um, I think. Reflecting a polarization here as well. I would say so. Uh, and it was very clear um, that with a complex statement, you can't reach uh, the public. Two words in a statement is fair enough. Yeah. When, um, I was, uh, when I was a communications coach, people asked me all the time about Donald Trump because in many respects he violates some of the rules of communication. I said there are two things he does better than anybody else. One, he knows who his audience is, and two, he talks in simple language that people understand. And that allows him to hit the bullseye every time. But is that our future? Are, are, are there ways to, to change the language? to address people asking you now That's as a communication a pretty, coach. That is a pretty profound question, and I don't know the answer to that. I don't know now that this is out of the bottle if we ever can truly reorient the conversation to be more cerebral and more substantive. I'm not sure. Okay. So um, that's a question for the feedback round, so maybe you can have one or the other idea then, then later. Is it a burning one, Moriba? Otherwise, we... Okay, oh. and we do it later. Okay, thanks. Um, let, let's move forward. Um, the national budgets, um, does the level of the national budgets reflect on the reporting, in your opinion, in your knowledge? Uh, no, no. Uh, because I think most of the American public just isn't tuned into the budgetary okay. debate. I really don't. I don't think they're there. And the emergence of uh, Rubber's private space industry had that an impact on the on your news coverage? Yes, I mean, uh, yes, yes, yes. People love to read about these space entrepreneurs. They've got big personalities. Um, they're you know the the Rockefellers and the Carnegies of our generation. People are intrigued by them. Every time Elon Musk speaks, the world stops to listen, right? Um, people love it, and I think it's generated a lot of interest. And they're masters of using the media, which, by the way, Miles O'Brien tells me they control. Um, just an interesting factoid here. He told me that he approached Elon Musk about doing live webcasts of his launches, and they were deep in conversations, and Miles, the journalist, said, well, you know, I have to have full editorial control. And Musk said, oh, no, I have to have the power to pull the plug. Hmm. And Miles said, can't do it, and he walked away from the project. But it's an indication that, that when we're talking here about a private entity, we may not be getting parts of the story that we might be if it's a governmental entity. Yep. I mean, it relates perfectly in this, in this next complex of questions. So, the private actors with access to, to, to data uh, or just access and the objective versus the usage of data by the services, meaning very concrete. So how does companies like Planet Spire, Max are, are to mention a few, 
influence public opinion by releasing Earth observation pictures from special events, such rocket launches, not in this case, recently one from North Korea, destroyed war, war areas in Syria, Sudan, or military installations, such in Iran. I suspect you know more about this than I do, so you give me your thoughts. <laughs> How's that for a table turning? Huh? <laughs> That's not fair. I wasn't. <laughs> um, I think that's an that's that's an so absolute relevant question, and I can't I can't answer it. Um, also, because there's, I think there's a, there's a danger. I mean, we we put our or the governments are put in place that we believe our government, but most of the countries in this room are. Uh, have elected our governments and representing the people of, of their countries. So um, the installation of the new services in, in these countries, I mean, in Germany, we have a bilateral system or of, of the state-owned uh, uh, channels and then the private ones. And you attempt to believe the state-owned. So that's, that's what it is. And I think there's a, there's a danger of using these pictures or on, on special occasions for reporting. I mean, we had this occasion in, I think, the tension are between um, Pakistan and, and India recently, um, where one claimed one thing, the other says the other thing, then pictures occur, um, are arrived, and um, the point is, we are at a stage where we don't know who we can believe. That's my, my opinion, that's my preservation. Um, but yeah, I, I, I can't answer it. I, I can't give a profound, profound answer. So. One point um, Raji talked yesterday or in, in the panel about was educating leadership about space. Boy, do they need it. <laughs> <laughs> what language is needed for them? Well, a story. Um, during the last election cycle, I was hired by a group called Americans for Peace, Prosperity, and Security to talk to presidential candidates about national security issues, because during the primary season, at least, they did not feel that these were getting enough exploration. So they dispatched me to do something you know, with Ted Cruz in North Carolina and Carly Fieri in New Hampshire. One of the things I did was with Jeb Bush. So I'm sitting in a big town hall meeting with Jeb Bush, and um, I'd recently read a Scientific American article about the prospect of war in space. So I turned to Jeb Bush, presidential candidate, and said, what about this potential for war in space? What, what are your ideas and thoughts? And Jeb Bush looked at me and said, that's a really important issue, and I don't know enough about it. So I'm not going to say anything now. I've got to get smarter before I comment. So one, amazement that he didn't know about it. But two, when I talked to people in the audience afterwards about their reaction to this town hall meeting, they loved that a politician was transparent enough to say, I'm not smart enough yet. But it shows me that you guys have a job to do that here was someone running for the presidency of the United States who didn't have baseline knowledge on the issues that you guys are talking about. And I think that should be alarming to everybody in the room. I would like to, to I'll take two comments from the, from the floor or before we head then to the space race uh, topic. Is it Vanessa? Yeah, okay, please. Um, thank you. And I guess it's part comment, part question. Um, I'm wondering about the media's role in bringing more diversity into our conversation. And, and I think uh, Daniel made the comment yesterday that it had been difficult to get, um, to get female presenters, uh, to get sort of an equal number. And the way I think about it is, you know, the space is so exciting. There's so much exciting stuff happening. And then somehow we, and the challenges we're trying to talk about in these security forums are so critical. We need, we need the best brains on this. 
But somehow we kill the excitement. We bring it into a multilateral forum and we just suck all the joy out of it. And I'm just... Oh, more I, on that. <laughs> I just think, you know, how do we get young women seeing space as a career for them, whether that's as scientists, whether it's as negotiators or developers of regulation? Um, and I think the media can play a really important role in that. Thanks. So just I, I think just, Australia is doing quite good in that, um, just, just to mention it. But So look at the black hole story, right? A lot of publicity about the young woman uh, who helped create the algorithm that made that possible, that image possible. You know what happened? That went viral, and then the trolls came out. And she was ripped to shreds on the internet. So I, I, would, I would just say we, this was an effort, I think, on the part of the people who are communicating about the story to put front and center somebody who had actually played a part in it, and the world reacted badly. That doesn't mean we shouldn't keep trying. I will tell you that I do some work for a big international women's group. We put Ellen Ochoa, who's head of the Johnson Space Center on stage. She and I did an hour-long interview with one another. We've had Katie Coleman, another American astronaut. Um, we did a session. The session with Katie was in Israel, where we had a couple of women from the technology industry on the stage talking about what they were doing. Um, I, I think there really is an effort. I think I'm even more concerned about the lack of racial diversity um, than I am about gender diversity. Um, and there are, thank God, groups like Girls Who Co Code um, that have started up that are really trying to generate uh, more interest. Um, and, and, but it's a tough nut to crack. There's absolutely no doubt about it. There's no doubt. And as for sucking the joy out of it, I'll talk a lot more. You won't be able to shut me up on that one. Mariba. <laughs> Yes, um, <clears throat> so I have, I think, some things that are going to make some people in the room uncomfortable uh, to bring to, to this dialogue. One, in general, uh, and th these are all my opinions, of course, our community of space people, we tend to be very elitist. Space is something that's very special. Uh, it's not accessible to most people because we're smarter than everybody else. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're groupies. You know, you mentioned the whole Elon Musk thing. It's like, really, at the last IAC that happened in Australia, the guy shows up and they eliminate a whole afternoon of technical sessions an hour before and after his presence so he can say something where he just stuttered some imbecilities in front of a bunch of people. I'm glad this is being recorded. So the thing is, <laughs> it was crazy. It was crazy to remove half a day of technical sessions where real problems get solved to listen to this guy look at a bunch of Legos, you know, uh, uh, we're going to get to Mars kind of thing. This is part of our problem. You know, everything in the media for space is dominated by the Bill Nyes, the Neil deGrasse Tysons, uh, the astronauts. T tell you what, astronauts are great, but they tend to not know a lot about space. They're very focused on low Earth orbit and being in free fall environments and doing experiments, but they're not necessarily solar physicists. They're not. So there's a larger space community that exists that needs to be reached. And at the end of the day, people don't realize the impact of space in their everyday lives. I think NASA does, uh, is trying to do a good job in, in, in doing that traceability of what do space technologies mean to everyday people? Once you can couch things in terms of, listen, if you lose this capability, you lose internet. You lose weather warnings to move you out of a town where uh, some cataclysmic event is going to happen. You lose being able to show people what they lose in the absence of a space capability. I think that's where the media needs to start taking us to versus this sensationalization and, and this elitism that we tend to experience in our community. Okay. I couple of threads there, let me pick up on. One, your last point, I agree with absolutely. People have to understand how this impacts, you know, how they find Starbucks and get their caramel macchiato. Absolutely. It has to come down to that kind of messaging for the general public. 
Um, I think that I think that the Bill Nye's and the Neil deGrasse Tyson's serve an important function. Um, they have been successful in communicating about science to people and getting people excited about about science. I was at a lecture that Neil deGrasse Tyson gave to a business group. This was a group that wasn't wired to care about what he talked to him talked about. But because he understood their interest and that they wanted to know how to make money out of space and what new technologies were going to develop out of space exploration, uh, and because of his innate enthusiasm, he got 500 people in that room fired up about space. So I think they serve a function. As to, as to I, I would agree to you that, that it's very formulaic that the media turns every time to, you know, Richard Blance, or Branson, Elon Musk, <coughs> Jeff Bezos, you know, they're, they're easy targets. But you said it's up to the media to find the more technical people. I think it's a two-way street. And I think the technical people have to find a way to talk about what they're doing People understand why it's important. And as for astronauts, were you there last night at the film screening? Jean-Francois uh, Clavois, am I saying his name correctly? French astronaut was there. He was a great communicator. This was a general interest audience as well as some people from this, from this meeting who were there. Um, did, did you all find him fascinating? Absolutely. He was great. What made him so great? Andre. You cannot blame the people who know how to promote themselves because some of us don't know how to do that. If you want to have your message heard, you need to craft it in a way that people will listen. It's not the astronaut's fault. It's not Elon Musk's fault. My understanding of Musk's thing in Australia was there was a rush. There was a lineup, and it was, went out into the hallway. I wasn't there. I heard about it on Twitter. That is important. I get the issue on the technical sessions. Um, what he provided was the energy in the room that carries the conversation. We need to leverage that to make it happen for the rest of us. Let's not push back against it. Let's co-opt it. Yeah, we, 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 we are coming back to this topic um, <laughs> later on, Moriba. So, I mean, let's talk about the why we are here, the space security things and the, uh, the space race uh, term. Are we in a space race 2.0 from the media point of view? Um, I think definitely. I mean, the media loves a horse race, right? That's what covering politics is all about. That's what covering space is to a certain degree. But the situation obviously is much more complex than it was during the first space race, which was U.S.-Soviet. Now you have so many more players, both uh, nation states and also private entities. And I'm not sure that the media has adequately portrayed the complexity of that situation to the American public, at least. I don't know internationally if it, it if it's more clear. Okay. Um, and the language people are using, um, at least in the U.S., uh, is very reminiscent. You know, we heard about predominance. Where are you? You're out there somewhere. There you are. <laughs> Yesterday, but we hear a lot about dominance. We hear about war fighting. Um, we hear America first. You know, that all frames it as a race. So some of that isn't the responsibility of the media. To my mind, that's how it's being framed by, by government officials. And perhaps to a certain degree, it's appropriate. I mean, there is a competition, is there not? But where is that in, co um, in connection to international cooperation? ISS, for instance, will that expand? I mean, when we're going to moon, when we go to Mars, do we need international? Is it a thing national I states do on the own? Aspirationally, I think it's absolutely fantastic. I mean, that's why all of you are in this room together, hoping to promote this. 
um, a worthy cause indeed. I'd say, you know, there are headwinds. You all know that better than I do. Um, how how yeah, I steep think it's, it it's, is. And, and, and again, I think it has to do with this telling the story. I'm not sure you guys have been telling the story about international cooperation. I mean, I personally, when I was talking to the National Science Foundation in preparation to coming here, and they were telling me uh, about the, um, the scientific community's real desire for cooperation um, and how fruitful that is for everybody involved when the scientists are communicating with one another and sharing. Um, it was a bit of an eye-opener to me, and I pay attention to the issues. So again, I think it's a case of not getting out there and, and giving the message. Okay. And if you want me to tell you how to give the message, I'm happy to do that. That's your audience. Um, these... Renata has a... Oh, Renata, sorry. Right. I, I just want to come back to something you said when you talked about the genius of Trump. Uh, you said knowing his audience, mm -hmm. because I've heard at least four different audiences mentioned here so far. Moriba, you said astronauts don't know anything compared to, let's say, the academic. I would have thought an astronaut's a pretty space specialized activity and job occupation group. So are we talking about the academic audience? Are we talking about the specialist involved in the industry or the practice of space exploration? Then we've got the... Um, general audience, we talked about how to get that message out, and then we've got the policymaker audience. And it, they're not all the same audiences, and those messages are very different. And it strikes me that we are not clear, and this conference is a good example from doing a movie night where we're talking to a general public, to having a discussion here, which is, what are policymakers going to do in the next 12 to 18 months about regulatory issues? And, and so we do think we need to be a little bit more precise about which one of those audiences we think are, pri are priorities to target, f to address, and to advance what I think we're trying to do here, which is options for regulation and governance in space to, to address risks. And those include risks of conflict. And that gets me at something that I think it, the media reproduces, which is a specialized nature. Because the guys who cover um, Elon Musk and, and Jeff Bezos, beyond the car auto and manufacturers, tend to be the business section of the newspaper. That's in the business section of the BBC world. The guys who cover the blue planet are in the nature section, the science section. So in a way, the same tensions that we see in the policy world here that are leading to gaps and to lack of action, I think is reproduced a little bit, it seems to me, in the media, where we, we have a similar sort of division. Uh, and that is really, I think, getting at us that there's a lot of gaps in our discussions and therefore a lot of gaps in our regulation. I agree 100%. Um, when it comes down to your audiences, they are different audiences. And number one rule in communications is to figure out what that audience cares about and frame whatever it is you're talking about in a way that it matches up with what they care about. That's the only way they're going to listen. If you're talking up here and they're thinking down there, it's like having an outlet and a plug. They never go together, the current never flows, and the lights never come on. So you really should be doing some serious analysis when you're crafting your messages about who the recipients are going to be. Sometimes they're going to care about money. I heard that come up this morning. Sometimes they're going to care about safety. Uh, you guys will be better at me at listing all the other things that they're going to care about, but each one is going to be a little bit different. But I'd also tell you this when it comes to communicating. Um, some of you come from an engineering background. Um, I would argue that that can be an impediment to communication. Um, no offense. But as a coach, I worked with a lot of people who are engineers and scientists. And you have your own special way of talking, which is great when you're talking with one another. And it's how you establish your credibility with one another. I get it. But when you are talking to audiences outside, you have got to 
shed your tendency to speak in jargon and to talk a lot about data. Data is not, in most cases, going to persuade people. It's going to persuade people are stories, fact-based narratives, if you will, that explain the importance of what you're doing to them. It goes back to what you were talking about a moment ago, about that people don't understand that if, they, if it weren't for satellites, you know, their smartphones wouldn't work. It's that kind of an explanation. When you're talking about the sustainability <coughs> goals, which we were doing a little bit of last night, instead of talking in sort of broad generalities about this helps us get a handle on climate, how about talking about a specific? Uh, and, and through a little research, you can find that farmer in Malawi who is dealing with a very specific weather situation and how through the wonder of smartphones and satellite technology and observation, he can be sent alerts that will tell him when is the optimal time to plant his harvest. And if he does that, that's going to increase his harvest by X amount. More people will be fed. It brings it down to the people level. Jean-Francois did a little bit of this last night when he talked about bees. Um, he was talking about how critical bees are, obviously, to agriculture, and that through satellite data you can pinpoint which are the best places to site hives because bee populations are in jeopardy. This is a way to make them more robust. If we have more bees, it fosters better agriculture that feeds more people. Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> you bring it down to impact. And I think you're going to be much more successful in talking about these issues rather than talking in vague generalities and avoid your acronyms. Okay, this is the UN, I understand. <laughs> but <laughs> please, out there in the real world, try and set them aside. But Renata, let me try to give my five cents to your question. Um, when we started Space Watch, uh, Global Space Watch Middle East, it was driven by this very, very um, alt altruistic question, what would we like to read about a region which is not reported about? And so we started to, was that to, to create this content? Because we thought if it serves us as a engineers, as space nerds, as, uh, as, as people that are interested in, in it, it might serve others as well. It was that rational. Good. I mean, um, let's, I'll go on here, and I mean, we are, we are deep in this topic of space security in this context of this conference, how we can convey this message to the, to the public. Um, will this public, will the public, taking this again, uh, understand the issue and why or why not? Or are there these special, specific obstacles that prevent officials telling the story about space security? Well, I, I think officials are inhibited by the fact that they don't often understand it. Um, but I was having an informal conversation with some of you last night after the movie screening, um, comparing this to the cybersecurity debate. I was one of the first reporters to talk about cybersecurity on television, and nobody knew anything about it 12 years ago. And now most people are aware. They get it. They understand um, what a what kind of impact a huge cyber attack could have on their lives or may have had on their lives. I think that's where you are in space security. I think if you, again, bring it down to how it's going to affect your life uh, and international relations, I think there is a way to communicate that and make people smarter about it. Uh, there are impediments, as I mentioned. I don't think there's always the scientific literature, the literacy that one would like on the part of the public, but I do think that that it can be taught, that people can absorb this. Let's have a closer look on the spatial awareness topic um, and how it is perceived outside the room. And I, I hate me for saying it, but are movies like Gravity, does that help? Or is it just, hey, it's just another Hollywood thing? I mean, regardless how real it is, and we, we all know these answers, 
or for, for that specific one, or does that help to convey these messages, or is it more contraproductive because it's just another headline? I think this, uh, the people in this room may have stronger opinions about that than I do. Um, I, I think movies about space um, keep cool. people, well, yeah, it keeps people interested. Um, now, they aren't always 100% factually correct, but I think it, it um, generates interest, and I think, you've, I think that's fundamental if you're going to have communication take place. So I, I think it is positive. And all what we do, the, there's, a, there's a fine line between science fiction and reality. Yeah. Because a lot of science fiction from the last 50 years, we turned into reality. Into reality, right. Yeah, How many it, things from Star Trek are now yeah. real? But, um, I mean, um, as we have Moriba here in the room, um, I mean, he, he was talking lately uh, at, at uh, TED or TEDx uh, to a wider audience. Are uh, formats like that to going out, again, specialized audiences as well, does that help? Yes. To convey this message? Yes. Did you get a lot of good feedback? There you go. So it works. Did you have a, there's a question. Paul, yeah. please. Thanks. Um, a couple of things. I mean, I'm interested in the cybersecurity. Um, the realization now, you know, the profile is much higher. But part of that is because hundreds of millions of individuals have had their personal data uh, compromised. Problem in the sense with uh, the space conflict is it hasn't happened. I mean, there's terrible potential, uh, but it hasn't occurred. So you can't make that direct link. You know, at the same time, I would think the dramatic effect of the contradiction between international cooperation, on one hand, as uh, symbolized by the ISS, and the, the hostile and bellicose rhetoric among uh, leading space powers on the other. I mean, I think that would be a natural. Uh, um, theme to explore. Um, and in that regard, um, given, and, and I agree very much with Renata's point about different uh, audiences and the need to uh, tailor, but if one, given the complexity of our topic, um, the need to uh, have a more informed uh, media rep or an opinion maker, and in an earlier era in terms of broad arms control and disarmament, there were efforts um, by uh, some to provide fellowships to a journalist to come to uh, you know an arms control think tank for uh, two weeks' time and get you know thorough background briefings so that that individual could be more informed in their commentary reporting thereafter. I haven't seen that applied in the, in the space security area, and I guess my question is. If, if such a thing was offered, do you think in current media terms there would be take up of it? Uh, would they be willing to, in a sense, provide uh, release staff for that kind of uh, education? Or are the, uh, you know, is the media edifice so compromised now that uh, that would be seen as uh, sort of um, uh, just a, a luxury that can't be uh, afforded? So. It's going to depend news organization to news organization, I think, and it's going to depend if it costs money or not. Um, I can tell you I participated in something Homeland Security related like this um, shortly after 9-11 when no media had any knowledge of this topic. There was a guy named Steve Flynn, a former Coast Guard guy who worked with the Council of Foreign Relations, and he offered a one-week tutorial, and reporters came in from all around the nation, and we spent one morning on aviation security, an afternoon on immigration, the next morning on intelligence. And for each one of these sessions, he brought in a couple of top experts to talk to us, and we had a lot of reading to do. Every single one of us walked out of that experience uh, with some sources um, and with a lot more information and a lot more in-depth background, and we all were better reporters because of it. I think it's a great model, and I would really suggest trying to do it and see if you got picked up. And I know the Space Foundation has been talking about doing something similar. So it might be worth a chat with them. Quick look um, at the uh, military assets and, and space briefly before we then go uh, to the um, inspiration that space can give us. Um, in the US, the public are, um, is the public aware of space security issues and are politicians because it's, it's Mark Tia Jean has a story here. Oh, well, that was the, the Bush story that okay. I told earlier, the, the Jeb Bush story, and how he had 
no okay. awareness. I don't Have think you... the general public is. I mean, I like to think that my immediate family is pretty tuned in. Uh, you know, both my husband and I worked in the news business for decades, and we were sitting around the dinner table with a larger group of family, and I just threw out there, so how much do you guys know about space security? Uh, didn't India just blow up a satellite? And that was it. They knew, like, the most current news story. And these are informed Americans, people that care, and they knew very little, and I think that's probably reflective. They're probably on the actually on the high end of the American public. Okay. Um, good. Uh, any comments, any, any, any points here to make? Uh, Andre, please. Uh, so in a former life in a galaxy far, far, far away, I was the uh, senior military officer responsible for the space program in uh, national defense in Canada. Uh, my full-time job was not program management, not policy development. It was business development for the space industry inside of D&D. I would su suggest to you that anybody that was making any decisions inside of military officers didn't really understand what sp space brought to the fight. Um, and it was a full-time job to keep educating very well-read, very intelligent men and women who didn't understand fundamentally about comms, ISR, uh, GPS, um, and how all of that was delivered to them, to the men and women on the battlefield. And it was an ongoing, I ran a course every four months for senior officers so they would understand. It's not that surprising to me that the general public doesn't understand space security. And how long ago was that, Andre? Uh, so that course has been running since 2009 and continues to run today. There is just, it's an ongoing effort to educate even people whose lives depend on those space systems. So, so we gotta cut the public a little bit of slack when, we, when the people who we think really know about this don't. Now there are significant exceptions, um, you know, when you have a a country that is working on a space force, clearly there is a better understanding. But there is all kinds of anecdotal uh, notes that come out about not really understanding. The professionals, space professionals understand, absolutely. Everybody else is, is focused on, on their part of the mission. It doesn't always include space or an appreciation to what it brings to the fight. So don't be discouraged. It's an ongoing activity. And if you don't approach it as a, a business development sort of activity, you're gonna fail. It really is about promotion. Renata was in a session that I did in Munich where I turned to everybody around the table and said, it is your job to tell this story, to get this story out there in the public debate. And you have got to do it every time you speak, um, keeping in mind who the audience is that you're talking to. But I would say big rules are storytelling and keep it simple don't get too far down into the weeds or you're going to lose people they haven't mm -hmm. got the patience for that but grab at it proselytize here this is an area you care about can i just have a two finger on that what they did a poll before this uh, discussion at the munich security conference they polled the public and it was one of those general invite the public a lot of young people a lot of college students um, as to what the functional roles of space should be. And by overwhelming majority was space should be reserved only for scientific exploration. And all the sort of space professionals were like, um, you know, that they don't get it and we've passed it beyond. But that is where the public perception is. And to be frank, movies like some of the ones we saw last night can reinforce a perception that it is remain some sort of silent, it's like scuba diving in your own ocean kind of thing. And I think that is a real issue still. Thank you, Jean. This has been extremely useful, uh, especially your, your advice about uh, delivering our message. On, on that same note, you know, here at Unidir and myself personally uh, on my work in space security, uh, I'm trying to refine not just the narrative that I'm telling, but also how do I deliver that narrative? 
uh, we were becoming much more active in social media. I happen to be of a unique age where like social media just barely missed me, so it's not quite natural, even though I am relatively young. But what, what are some of the other channels that you think that we should be reaching out, particularly for our audience who is, say, for example, in, in the diplomatic community or in the um, you know, lawmaking communities? Like, what, what do you think would be some other ways that we could usefully reach out to the public? Um, how many of you are podcast listeners? There you go. Duly noted. Uh, I, I personally, I'm not a podcast listener. I'm overwhelmed by the number of choices that are out there, so I don't make any choice. But this reflects that there are a lot of people who are tuned into that. So that might be something you can, if, if not starting a podcast, get on as a guest to one that actually has some listenership that's already developed uh, and piggyback on their success. That's what I'd suggest. I think that's the, and, and Instagram, I, it's very, talk about simplistic, but <laughs> maybe uh, they'll even get somebody to click on your webpage. To, to close up, I would like to spotlight on a topic that is very close to my heart and that's space as a great inspiration for the next generation. Mm -hmm. um, being one of, of the elder people, Daniel, here in the room, yeah, so. Um, how do we motivate students um, with, that, with that subject? Um, a story, yeah. another story here. So I'm the youngest of five kids, and um, one of my brothers was in elementary school when Sputnik went up. And he was identified as having some talent in math and science and was put in our very lower middle class suburb of Boston, was put in a specialized education program. Um, he went on to get a doctorate in particle physics, excuse me, I'm so proud of him, from Stanford. Um, and one of his classmates from uh, that same program graduated with him from Stanford with a physics degree. My brother then went on and got a law degree from Harvard. He's the undereducated one in the family. You know. um, and, and he became um, chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. I mean, science, he, he blended science and law throughout his community, his, his career. And after he left the NRC, he then became president of the Carnegie Institute for Science. This is all the result of a very specialized educational program which picked out young talent and developed it, gave it an avenue, gave it an outlet. It paid off for him and his good buddy, Paul Yarmatino, who both went on to have careers in, in science and physics. So I think education is the most important thing. Um, and I know other nations are far ahead of the United States and where we are. Um, I actually uh, am the parent of two kids and was appalled at the science education that they got, um, even at, at a very good private school in Washington, D.C. It was terrible science instruction. They extinguished interest in science. I really think that the scientific community has to do whatever it can to try and reinvent and reinvigorate um, that whole area of study. I think that's, that's the number one key. I think a remarkable work uh, has been done in terms of education, um, inspiring the next generation by Israel uh, recently with Bereshit, with, with the lender and the entire um, ramp up for, 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 for the flight. Um, I mean, I was listening to a podcast with, I think, uh, David Lieberman uh, from, from, from the team. He, he talked about how they went out to the schools or uh, 10 years ago, eight years ago, and now these people are grown up and coming back and saying, hey, can we have a job here? Can we work with you? And I think that's how it goes. It, it takes time, of course. And Lighthouse Project, and that's something I would like to uh, finish up here, is, is the role of Lighthouse Project in what we do. Is it the Falcon Heavy or the first one with the first scene to land, to boost us landing. This is the ISS. It is there for ages now. So is it still that sexy? Or, and, and can we reach out to others? The suborbital flights, New, New Shepard, Virgin Galactic, Earth observation and analytics. I mean, huge thing. And I think many of us are excited about this. And, but 
how we convey this. I mean, how we turn it into lighthouse projects or space exploration to the moon now. Well, I've spent a little time in Israel, and as I mentioned, I did a, a panel on space there, and there were so many special things about that situation. Uh, when you had the huge influx of scientific knowledge um, from Russia, um, which provided a really high level of, of scientific achievement, and then that whole interface between the military and private industry, and how you've got this pipeline not only from youth, but then people who specialize in the military in these issues, and then transition sometimes, I, I understand, as a team, right? People who all serve together will then go out into the private sector and start a, start a business. So there seems to be an ecosystem that's created in Israel that supports this kind of, of knowledge uh, and education that's obviously been productive. But I mean, I, I think the remarkable thing is that, uh, I mean, most of the countries um, which are presented here uh, have their space agencies and space agency representatives are here. In most of the constitution of the space agency, there is this educational part in it. How well are they doing? And then you, ha you have then a private team who does it different. And that's reported about. It's not the day-to-day -day job. I mean, I know from, from Germany, DLR is doing a great job on that. But does it make it to the media? No, I mean, um, Bernard. Uh, yeah. um, I mean, Alex Gers is a is a superstar in, in in Germany now, so that's cool. He engaged with people, but is that reported about? No, it's 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 a normal. So, and with a normal, you can't you can't excite people, in my opinion. Well, maybe it's normal. And are you saying it's normal so the media wouldn't be interested in it? Mm. Or has anybody, has anybody tried to pitch the media on it? I mean, there has to be some proactive, um, the media has to know about it to report on it. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, a final round of, of feedbacks, questions, uh, remarks from, from your end uh, to stay, st stay on time. There's one back here I see, obscured oh, by the camera. Alex. Yes, thank you, Alexandre Valley. Um, I have a question, in fact, about the, is it really useful to get more media coverage? Uh, and I will just take uh, an example. Um, during the last uh, discussion on the European Union budget, um, there was a, a strong uh, request from the European Commission to increase the space budget. And in fact, of course, it went to the uh, arcans of, of the uh, negotiations. But it was one of the easiest part of the budget, of the general EU budget, to get approved by the member states. So um, that's true that the space may not be so popular, but uh, the advantage, in my view, is that it's also not very popular uh, by, uh, be, uh, for bad reasons, I would say. Because you take the example of Serbia security. That's true, many people know now about cyber security, but make many, mainly because they know that there are many problems. And I'm not so sure that it is so useful for the space community, or for the space industry, or the space sector in general, uh, to be known because there are many problems, if you wish. Uh, so is it really a problem that the, the media coverage is not so high, or is it something that we may live with, uh, noting that we have not extremely good media coverage because, as you mentioned, we are doing things that pretty much work uh, without major uh, problems, I would say. And that is indeed a, a bit long, uh, normal thing, I would say. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for, for this remark. And um, I will pick up on our, what Renata said earlier. I mean, there is not the, the audience. Um, to communicate or to. I mean, of course, if you just have one TV channel, then th there's not too much um, how you can diversify. But I think we, we do have this channel to special groups. Or, and we all have. I mean, may it be Twitter, may it be our Facebook community, what, whatever it is. Um, but to say, hey, it is too complex, we shouldn't report about it, is from my media point of view, not the right one nor even from my technical point of view. So um, that, that can't be the solution, because that brings us down to these two-word messagings that lead us to a Europe where we are today. 
I, you know, I, I just always thought media coverage would generally be a positive thing, particularly when you're trying to generate a budget. I'm fascinated to hear your perspective on it. In the U.S., you know, there has to be a constituency fighting for the money, and it has to be heard. So I think in the U.S. it, it is incumbent upon people to try and get the message out, maybe not elsewhere. Tom. Please. Just a quick comment uh, before someone uh, asked about uh, how to inspire uh, the next generation. Uh, I have a person, I, I follow you, I have a, a short story. It is the second time that I'm telling it. Uh, the first was at the Ilan Ramon uh, International Space Conference when I was a kid. There was no internet, no uh, books in Hebrew about, uh, about space exploration. So I went to a planetarium around, I was around uh, about uh, eight years old, and I found a book with addresses of NASA centers, and I um, had to teach myself how to uh, typewrite in English, and uh, I wrote letters to NASA asking for materials, and uh, it took some time, but I got a lot of pictures and booklets and books and so on. And uh, later on, as an adult, I, I thought, what, why was NASA is spending all the money on a kid from the Middle East? And I told it from the podium at the Ilan Ramon Space Conference to the NASA administrator, who was my guest. So this was a closure, uh, and this is why I'm always uh, answering emails and tweets from uh, kids uh, before uh, the daily job. So, thank and you very did much. he give you an explanation for why NASA? He said, spent? "Well, this is this is why. This is why. Yeah, yeah, of You're course. You're why. Sure. This is the result <laughs> yeah. they were hoping yeah, yeah. for. It was outreach." Yeah. Good. Thank you very much for, for your attention. Um, thanks again uh, to Daniel, to Renato, and, and your team to, for having us here. And if you're interested in what we do, please subscribe to our biweekly newsletter. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, for indulging me on this panel. Uh, I hope you found it as interesting and fascinating as I did. Uh, we're going to take a 30-minute break now, so everyone can go outside, get a coffee, have a cigarette if you need one. Uh, and then we're going to come back for probably one of the most anticipated panels of, uh, of this conference, which is going to be gathering evidence in orbit. So we'll see you back at 2.30. What's the matter? What? This chair's hurt. Did that do what you wanted it to do? Uh, exceeded